Hi everyone, a bit related, but we're here now uh, with Neil Humphreys. Um, do you gonna let you introduce yourself and your books to start off with, Neil, while I pin the stream? Yes, and I just want to apologise first. Uh, it's my fault. I forgot the clocks changed in England last week. Completely my fault. No excuses. And I was tied up with my daughter. Apologies to those who was waiting. Uh, and, and thank you to the UK Crime Book Club. Thank you for having me. Yes, uh, my name is Neil Humphreys. I am the author of the Inspector Lowe trilogy, um, which began with Marina Bay Sins and Rich Kill Poor Kill. And the latest book, uh, The uh, Bloody Foreigners, uh, which I'm holding up now, that came out first in the UK as hardback. And basically, it's about a Singaporean Chinese detective who um, was educated in the UK and then heads out to uh, his first two books are set in Singapore. And with the third book, Bloody Foreigners, he heads to the UK for a speaking tour of uh, universities. And uh, a Singaporean gets murdered in Chinatown. And so they call him in for advice. Not the best thing to do. He's a bit obnoxious, to say the least. He's a bit obnoxious. He's very sweary. He's uh, He doesn't brook authority. He, he doesn't listen very well to being told what to do. But And he's got a lot of skeletons that if you read further into the trilogy, you'll understand why he has them. Um, he's a good man. He's a, he's, a, he's a good man. But he has um he doesn't have much eq sometimes he uh he just does what he does what he does and he says what he thinks he doesn't always hold back he has no filter so you unleash this uh, detective into london for bloody foreigners and uh, mayhem in shoes I'm, I'm imagining the mayhem i've not read bloody foreigners yet because i started at the beginning oh, okay yeah. well Best place to start. Yeah. The series, um, I'm just like, I like to read in order. So I've read Marina Basins and we were just saying I'm this far through. Okay. Second. Thank you. Uh, so very enjoying them. I start finished Marina Basins and instantly started the second. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm intrigued. What, what's what been weighing on me as I've been reading them is that I really want the story of his sort of beginning if you know what I mean you know how he's so obnoxious and he's had all of this happening mm. are we ever going to get the prequel uh yes actually it's I'm trying to find if I have it on the shelf um I'll check in a moment but he actually appeared in a book called Match Fixer uh I wrote a novel called Match Fixer in 2010 uh to comment on the fact that Singapore was then very much as an international hub for football match fixing uh, and as a former sports reporter I covered some match fixing cases in Singapore, which is where the inspiration came came from. So it was almost autobiographical. I mean, it was fictional, but it was slightly autobiographical in the sense that it was um, my introduction into a world I didn't know. So in the book Match Fixer, it's a British footballer who ends up playing in the Singapore Premier League Football League, which occasionally happens here, and he gets caught up in this world of match fixing. But within that, um, I needed this um, plot device, really, uh, this this plot, this twist. I won't give it away because people may read it, but uh, this twist. And to do that, I needed a character to go undercover, to be undercover for most of the book and then reveal himself. And that was Inspector Lowe. He was uh, an incidental character, but he was working for, which comes out more in that book, he was working for this crime syndicate in Singapore, run by this elusive Chinese guy that is known as Tiger. Um, he's very much sort of the Hannibal Lecter to Inspector Lowe's Will Graham, if you like. And he worked for Tiger, in my backstory. He worked for the Tiger Syndicate in Singapore, undercover, which was a, uh, a gambling loan shark, which in Singapore is called Ah Long. So he was an Ah Long, which means loan shark. So he was an undercover Ah Long loan shark working for this, what we call Care Long. Care Long means fixed, uh, this sort of fixed match fixing operation, money laundering, um, match fixing, money laundering, and also uh, loan sharking. And he did that undercover. And it's one of those where he was so good at it that he, he couldn't really see where the line was. 
But um, so so that's how it started. So that is kind of the prequel match fixer. So when I was approached to write a novel, I could I kept coming back to this character, even though he's only an incidental character in Match Fixer. I like the duality. I thought it had real potential that you've got this English educated Chinese Singaporean who can switch it on and off. He can become this uh, guttural, visceral, uh, singlish spouting, which would be in an English equivalent would be like really strong Cockney or Scouse or Mancunian, very much the language of the street. Uh, the street patois is really singlish. So he can talk like this vulgarity spouting Chinese gangster, but then switch it and become this English educated London School of Economics graduate uh, detective inspector. And I just thought that was great. The way that he can step into these two worlds, one from the other, was where I got the idea for Marina Bay Sins. He's got quite a duality in his personality as well, hasn't he? Oh, definitely. Um, my wife says it's far too autobiographical <laughs> uh, for, for her liking. Um, so, yeah, there is a lot of Inspector Lowe in me, I have to admit, um, his personality. He, he's, he's very intelligent. He's fast talking. He can be very funny, but cuttingly funny. Um, annoyingly funny i don't really think you'd want necessarily to inspect a low at a dinner party but you would want him in an interrogation because he will get through he will cut through and uh, i'm not going to lie one of my favorite writers ever is uh, jimmy mcgovern who wrote uh cracker and uh recently the brilliant time if you've seen it with sean bean and uh, stephen graham the, the prison drama for bbc he is a huge hero of mine, uh, Jimmy McGovern, uh, the Liverpool writer. Working class background like me, writes about really gritty urban issues like me. And um, it's obvious if you've read the books that Cracker is, the TV series Cracker that Robbie Coltrane was in, was very influential to me. Um, because I was at university in Manchester when Cracker was being filmed. So if you can imagine how terrifying that was, because in the TV series, Cracker, if you've seen it, Cracker goes around the very streets and and uh, houses that I lived in as a poor student in Manchester. And he was supposed to lecture. At, he never did, but he the character was meant to lecture at Manchester University. So occasionally they would actually, uh, you know, cordon off parts of the university when I was there to film Cracker. So you can see how influential it was to me to be living in Manchester as a student when they're filming Cracker on the very streets that I was living in at that time. And so I loved the psychological stripping of the character of the of the suspects that the character of Cracker used to do. And so it, there's a lot of that in Inspector Low. As a writer. I must admit, I do get excited when I know the interrogation is coming, when I know it's building up to this, this big mano y mano scene where, as a writer, I know I have to get from A to B in the interrogation, i.e. he has to extract a confession. And I have some idea of how I'm going to get there. But the best thing about being a writer is when you hit the keys and they just start talking and Inspector Lowe starts talking to me, through me. Uh, that sounds a bit pretentious, but that, that's how it is. Once Inspector Lowe comes in and takes over and he, he talks and, and I have to type, sounds really pretentious, but I have to type really fast almost to keep up with him. That's, that's the best part. That's the bit I look forward to, the big interrogation in the book. Influenced by Cracker. <laughs> I would not have picked that up. I don't think I've ever really watched Cracker. Um, oh. Yeah, I have it on my shelf. I love Cracker. I'm, I'm a massive, massive uh, uh, Jimmy McGovern fan. I am a huge Jimmy McGovern fan. Great well, writer. Got some hellos from like Laura, uh, Leslie, Sam. Uh, Sam's also shared the Kindle link to Match Fixer, so I can go and download that when I've finished, um, which would be excellent because I, I feel like I need to go and read that now as well. 
need I need the full Inspector Lowe experience. Yeah, maybe we'll release it at some point because it's not really, you know, an Inspector Lowe book per se, as I mentioned. It's just an introduction to the character. And um yeah, as I say, when there was a chance to write a, a, a real first novel, I, he was an itch. He was an itch I couldn't scratch. I mean, to be honest, there's a main, this sounds terrible, but there is a main featured detective in uh, Match Fixer, and I can't even remember his name. <laughs> uh, you know, so he, he didn't he didn't stay with me in the same way that Inspector Lowe did, you know, without giving too much away. Obviously, you know, because it's in the backstory of the other books that he was this undercover operative. So there's this big, Ta-da! Reveal moment in Match Fixer where he just suddenly switches accents, and I don't know if that's considered a stretch to maybe a British reader. I don't know, but in Singapore, this idea of code switching is actually quite common, where you would speak Singlish in the coffee shop, and then speak more standard English in, say, the classroom or the or the office or so on. And I know if, if you did that in England, you'd be seen as a bit of a prat, to be honest. If, if you if you kept changing your accent for different audiences, I know. Like when I remember when the manager Steve McLaren went to Holland and he started speaking with a Dutch accent, and everybody took the piss out of him. But I was one of the few people that kind of understood slightly where he was going as someone who's lived in different countries. You do code switch. I code switch every day when I'm in the coffee shop. I might slip into a bit of Singlish or a smattering of, of my terrible Mandarin and so on. So for someone like Inspector Lowe to, to switch, to have this ability to go from Singlish to more stat and, and Hokkien, which is a Chinese dialect, to go from Singlish to English at the drop of a hat, it's not, the, it's not as hard as it seems. I mean, Singaporeans do it all the time. It, no, it worked for me reading it, I, I believed believe those changes in him oh great great it worked uh we've got a few questions rolling in as well sure. so uh sam wants to know and i'm sure this comes from when she recorded the promo with you sorry i was at work when you could do it um where she said how were the many many cakes that were baked in your house last week I feel like <laughs> this is a story we need to know <laughs> I just feel bad because now I feel bad again because Samantha reminds me that I've come in late. Again, apologies. My apologies. Um, it was my fault. I got mixed up with the timings and my daughter. And I will say it is partly because of the cakes. Because after I left Sam, um, when we did the promo, my daughter did go off. and uh, but My wife and daughter. And they baked, six, I think it was 50 to 60 cupcakes. And we were just slowly getting through them with friends. And we were eating them earlier. And Sam, I have to say, they were delicious. The, maybe not a patch on the Cinnabon, Cinnabon, which I know Sam is eating a lot of. But um, they're actually very good. And my daughter made them without a recipe. Um, yeah, she just sort of, she's made them a few times now. So she just did eggs, flour, sugar, and did it herself. Yeah, so instinctively. Quite impressed. Quite impressed. Awesome. Uh, I'll ask you the rest of the questions as well. Sam's got a few. She said she's looking hmm. forward to reading Bloody Foreigners. Where did the story idea come from? Oh, that's a that's a great question, Sam. Um, okay. Two things. I always intended at some point to put my two worlds together because I thought it would give me and the book a, a unique perspective. You know, I lived in I lived in England until I was twenty one. And then I've lived in Asia ever since, including five years in Australia. So I have this unique perspective, not a better perspective, just unique um, to live until your childhood university in England and then your adult life in Singapore. So I have a very you know, unique take on both cultures. But also, more interestingly, as I said to Sam, when you go, when you're in a country day to day, obviously you don't necessarily notice the changes, right? Because they're incremental and they're day by day. But if you leave a country for two years and then come back or three years and then come back 18 months, my trips are usually like 18 months, two years apart. The changes become more perceptible and, and, and more glaring. And I have to say that say from about 2010 onwards, when I would go back to England, I just felt uh, in, in my housing estate where I grew up, I grew up in a place called Dagenham, which is East London, 
Um, firstly, the, the demographic of Dagenham was changing. You know, let's be frank. The colour of Dagenham was changing. It was becoming uh, much more multiracial. It was mostly white when I grew up, uh, but it had changed over the years. And that seemed to, I'll be honest, upset some people. And um, and the more I came back, the more I would see this change. And, and people were starting to express things either publicly or with me or in newspapers or on websites, whatever, that I didn't think they would have been sharing maybe five or ten years before. In other words, let's be honest, what was previously seen as quite right-wing thinking was almost becoming mainstream thinking. And so as someone who grew up in England, I found it strange and I, I started to feel not an alien, that's that's too much of a stretch, but I started to feel slightly um, of an outsider sometimes in the conversation and a bit uncomfortable with some of the conversations about foreigners and about xenophobia and refugees and all this kind of thing. And, and I was like, hello, I'm a foreigner in somebody else's country, you know. <laughs> so when you talk about foreigners in a, in a you know, and that's actually me. And I'd get a little bit uncomfortable and I would sort of come to the defense of, of new migrants to the UK and whatever. So I would see this opinion over time gradually change. And I thought, well, if it's unusual for me, what would it be like for Inspector Lowe, who in my mind left Singapore, uh, sorry, left the UK when I did, which is very convenient, right? <laughs> he studied in the UK from about sort of the mid 90s, mid to late 90s. And then he studied at the London School of Economics and then he came to Singapore and he hadn't been back since. And I thought, wouldn't it be interested if he returns as a Chinese guy, he goes to Singapore, he goes to, sorry, he goes to London in a post-Brexit, uh, slightly sensitive, slightly polarised London. That's one. Two, he has a crime to deal with. Three, the person dealing with the crime is someone who was once the love of his life and actually came with him to Singapore. And you find out in the book why they separated. So you've put in this, he comes back to a country where it's very different to when he left. And there's a little bit of racial sensitivity. There's a murder. And the ex-love of his life is now married to somebody else. Put all that together. And it's just, well, for someone like Inspector Lowe, it's explosive, as it turns out in the book. I can imagine. Can't wait to get on to that one now. Uh, Sam has also asked if all of your characters are based on fictional people, or are there some real people mentioned? Uh, for legal reasons, I will say they're <laughs> all based on fictional people. Yes, they are completely invented for my imagination. No, I, I, I do say it's a bit of a trite comment, but it's the truth. Um, all of my comment, all of my characters to a degree have an element of, have an autobiographical element to them. I know that sounds a cop out, but it happens to be true. For me to write a character, I have to not necessarily like them or agree with them. Obviously, in the cases of the murderers, I don't, but I have to understand them and I have to empathize with them. Otherwise, I, I get bored with one dimensional. Uh, kind of cardboard cutout characters. If someone's a killer, I have to understand why. If someone's a detective, I have to understand why. If someone's a housewife, I have to understand why. Whoever the characters are in my books, I have to understand them, I have to know them, and I have to empathize with them. I don't have to agree with them. And so there is a there's an autobiographical element in all of my characters. Either they'll say things that I might say in that situation, or, and I'll never be public about this, but or they'll say things that I've actually heard people say in those situations. I mean, there's one, there's one funny one. I can't remember what book it is, but some, some, someone talks about domestic helpers. In Singapore, we have domestic helpers, right? Maids, who I don't, but many people do, uh, live in domestic helpers they live in your apartment and you know and so, and in the book i had a character say something quite derogatory about domestic helpers and an old friend of mine an old acquaintance of mine read the book and said oh 
that thing that that character said about the way you treat domestic helpers maids was terrible i said yeah it really was yeah that person was the person who said it <laughs> in real life years <laughs> before years before i had no memory of it but actually said it to me about probably 10 or 15 years before this and i just always remembered it it always stuck in my mind and then i used it i put i put it word for word into a character's mouth it's a terrible thing that the character says about maids and uh the actual person who said it came back to me and said well oh, wasn't that terrible yeah it was you but uh let's they'll never know. Yeah, they'll, they'll never know you know, it's like anything. You read these things, right? It's fascinating. When you read these things about characters or you always think it's somebody else, right? You always think it's not you. Oh, that behavior is terrible. I would never do that. You know, there's always that. Sometimes there's that that slight lack of self-awareness. I mean, I do it. Everybody does it. Oh, that would never be me. I, I would never say that or do that. So, um, yeah, either the characters have autobiographical elements in the sense that they're things I would say or do myself in that situation, or they're things that in, in some cases I've seen or heard people say, or things that they might say, obviously not the murders. I, I, I don't know any murderers or anything like that, but I have met, how can I say this? <laughs> I have known people who have maybe um, inspired elements of the murderers shall we say especially rich kill poor kill which i think you're reading especially rich kill poor kill that is one uh, of it's also the one i think the comment about the maids is in oh there you go quite possibly yeah quite possibly yeah quite possibly um yeah that that character not giving anything away that character firstly the name i'm a big fan of the name he's called talik right Talek, I love that name. T A L E K. What, what's his surname? Do I call him? I can't remember. You'll have to tell me. Is it Talek Harris? I can't remember. But Maxwell. his Christian name, Maxwell. That's right, Maxwell. Well, I'm happy to tell you that Talek is based on a. Uh, the character's not, but I, I met someone called Talek, and I just thought that was such a great name that I have to use it. it it's got that kind of. I'd never heard it before or since, but. Um, it's got that almost Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver kind of very unusual name, but very distinct name. And I wanted a Travis Bickle type name for this character. So Talek is the Christian name. And Maxwell, well, there's a negative connotation to that surname anyway in the UK. But also it's the name of a street and a hawker center, a food court in Singapore. So it has that connection as well. And I'm... A, I'm I'm very, f <laughs> this sounds terrible. I'm very fond of that serial killer uh, in, in uh, Rich Kill, Poor Kill in the sense that um, he's quite a well-rounded character. I think he'd be a very interested, he'd be, he'd be a very interesting character for someone to play if, if and when they, they make a TV series. I think he's, a, he's an interesting character because it's that, I don't know if you've been to Asia or this part of the world, but it's a very exaggerated version of a certain kind of expat that still exists so it's almost me satirically what if you had that kind of expat and you really extended his personality you know to to the to its limit what would it look like and that's where talik maxwell comes from so i've never met a serial killer but i've met quite a few people who have some of those um, views, shall we say. I've not been that far into Asia. I've lived on the Asian side of Turkey. Oh, right, nice. Which uh, part? Uh, Istanbul. Right, right, right. Okay. I've not been there myself. I, I, you know, I have to get to that part of the world at some point. It's intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> uh Right, I'm going to ask you the rest. So, Phil, oh, Phil Jordan's watching. He's an author in Ireland. He said he's late to this, but hello. And he loves hello. Jimmy McGovern. As well. Oh, all great, right. Great to hear about how other authors are influenced. He's a huge fan of those protagonist-antagonist face-offs. 
Yeah, thanks very much. That's from who? Phil, did you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Absolutely. Um, uh, Jimmy McGovern, well, firstly, Jimmy McGovern is an absolute genius. I mean, a working class guy from Liverpool, uh, very little education. He writes in an absolutely profound way. If anybody has, you know, it's on the BBC iPlayer, I believe, right now. And uh, if you haven't seen Time, just an extraordinary extraordinary piece of writing about the prison system in the uk and, and just i don't know if they've had the award season yet i don't know but St sean bean and uh stephen graham should just win everything and i also think like anything it's it's the time of your life that you read something or watch something and because Tra a cracker came out in the mid 90s mid to late 90s when i would have been around 17 18 19 20 kind of age when I was just starting to understand the, you know, you, you grow up and TV's just something there and it's entertaining. And then you, when you get to a teenager, you start to think about the people behind the camera and who put the words on the page and so on. So just as I was starting to understand that there's someone who wrote this and there's someone who directed this and so on and cast this, it was just the time I started to watch uh, Cracker. And if, I mean, on my shelf up here, I've got, I think everything that Jimmy McGovern has done, he did another great TV series called The Accused. He did another one called uh, The Street. The Street was very good. Uh, that was across, I think, three series. And what I like about Jimmy McGovern is that he, he like me, I'm not comparing myself to Jimmy McGovern. I want to make that clear. But um, I, I have to write about something. I'm not talented enough um, um, where I can just, I'm not Agatha Christie, genius, Agatha Christie, absolute genius. I can't just write murder after murder after murder, you know, thriller after. It has to be about something. To, to I have to be angry, basically. And Jimmy McGovern has said that. You know, when he's angry, he does his best writing. So if there was a theme for all of my Inspector Lowe books, I could actually sum it up in one word. And uh, it's hypocrisy. One word, hypocrisy. I'm, I'm, it makes me angry, you know, human uh, hypocrisy, society hypocrisy, and so on. So if, if you went book by book, uh, the first book, uh, Marina Bay Sins, that would kind of be um, uh, economic hypocrisy, the way that Southeast Asia will sort of close one eye to where we get our money from. And, you know, because there's quite a bit of money laundering in this part of the world, you know, and it, you're seeing it right now, right, with London and the, and the Russian oligarchs. I mean, for 10 years, it's not like we didn't know where the money was coming from. We all knew where the money was coming from. But now that Russia's invaded Ukraine, suddenly we're, oh, it's terrible now. But we've known this for years. It's hypocrisy. So the first book was kind of economic hypocrisy. The second book was uh, social hypocrisy. This idea that I thought to myself, I was inspired by uh, a domestic helper. Uh, I can't remember the exact case, but many years ago in Singapore, a domestic helper died. And I just thought it was really sad. I can't remember the circumstances. But it was just that thing that, you know, some lives and some deaths literally are worth more than others. Um, so there's that social hypocrisy. People are not equal. We are not born equal and we don't die equal. So I thought, what if you took that to its almost dark, satirical extreme and you have this serial killer who almost does it as a social experiment? What happens if I kill rich people and poor people? How will the society react accordingly? So it's a bit of a you know, scathing indictment on how, particularly in Singapore, particularly in Southeast Asia, I always say we don't have a class system so much like the UK, you know, a defined triangle, working class, middle class, upper class. We just have two classes of people in, in Singapore, really those with money and those who don't. <laughs> and those who do, they get revered and, you know, bowing and scraping. And those who don't get ignored or marginalized. So I thought, what if you took that, as an almost as an experiment, you have this serial killer who literally starts killing rich and poor people to see what happens. So th that book is a uh, that book is um, social hypocrisy, and the third one is racial hypocrisy. You know, racial hypocrisy. You know, we say we're tolerant. 
we say we're tolerant as a species of, of different races, but what does that really look like, really? And if and what I'm particularly pr proud of of bloody foreigners um, is that I try my hardest to look at it from all sides. It's not a Daily Mail interpretation of race in the UK, but I, I look, but it's not a Guardian interpretation of race either. I try really hard to look at it from all sides. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Um, because I, just to add to that, I do think where I have a unique perspective is because I grew up in a very working class environment. But because of the nature of what I do and my job and all that, you know, I've probably moved into a more middle class environment. I mean, listen to me. So I, I understand that world because I'm from that world. I understand their concerns. I understand why Brexit happened. I, I can I can completely put myself in that headspace. I'm not one of these guys who goes, you know, uh, you know, I'm a Remainer, so all Brexiteers are morons, and I'm a Brexiteer, so all Remainers are morons. No, I, I don't do that. In Bloody Foreigners, I really try to examine both sides of what is a really polarised situation. You know, why do people on this side think this way, and why do people on that side think that? And just to complicate it even more, I try to do it in different races as well, not just Caucasians. I look at Indians, I look at the Chinese, um, and so on. And 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 whether I got it right or wrong, that's for other people to say. Well, I'm going to read you this comment from Laura, who's read it, because she said she liked how it was looking at a current issue um, without being preachy. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, thank you, Laura. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Laura. Um, that means a lot to me because... All right, okay. <laughs> I'm, try, I'm trying to be diplomatic. One of the inspirations, I'm happy to say this, one of the inspirations, I don't know if, you know, uh, the, there's an LBC presenter called James O'Brien who got very, very famous during Brexit, right? Because he was... You see, you've probably seen his YouTube clips. They've gone viral every day. And, you know, James O'Brien, he's quite famous in, in London, in London. And even though, even though I agree with what he's saying for the most part, he can come across as maybe a little bit patronizing and smug to anyone who didn't go to university or who didn't go to public school or who didn't and so on and so on. And I, you know, and if and I completely understand that because that's the world I'm from. So if you, it's like, it's like poking a dog with a stick. If you keep telling people they're stupid, they're dumb, they're racist, they're this and that, they're not suddenly going to go, oh, you know what? You're right. I am racist and stupid and dumb. I wish I hadn't have done this now. They're just going to double down. <laughs> That's human nature. So you're going to get this side remain doubling down and you're going to get this side leave doubling down and they're just going to constantly scream at each other back and forth, back and forth, and there's going to be no progress whatsoever. And someone like me, who's not there every day, but looking at it from the outside and watching this screaming back and forth, remain, leave, remain, leave. I have this, I, you know, I sit there looking at Twitter and social media and the press and listen to family and friends and, you know, you want to pull your hair out. So I, I, to Laura's point, I was very, very keen to show both sides to show that this is why certain people in certain elements of society, working class particularly, where I'm from, this is why certain elements of the white working class feel this way. And if you slag them off and if you patronise them and if you call them dumb and stupid and make fun of them on radio shows and things like that, they're not suddenly going to go, oh, you know what? You're right. <laughs> That's not how white working class people behave. <laughs> and so I wanted to show that. But equally, I wanted to show the other side as well. So I hope I got it across. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to read you some more of the questions because we've got so many coming in. Uh, sure. So Leslie is interested in your books because she's got a friend in Singapore. And she also wants to know if you write full time and if you don't, what's a day job? <laughs> Um, thank you, Leslie, and thanks for uh, joining in. Um, mostly, 
right full time mostly um, and i'm assuming i'm talking to writers out there so i try to be as optimistic as i can but what i will say is um the industry industries because i work obviously in publishing and and print media is trying to do everything it can to put me out of work <laughs> as i'm sure it is for the writers listening right now um you know the newspaper i wrote for for 12 years closed just before christmas so i lost that job uh and then covid happened so a lot of my work is um going to schools and doing writing workshops and creative writing workshops and and uh, uh you know presentations and i couldn't do that for two years because of covid i also write children's books i've written about 10 children's books which are very popular in uh, South East, or, or luckily so far have been quite popular in Southeast Asia. And believe it or not, I apply the same rules, uh, that gritty realism. Uh, I still like, they're, they're quite funny. Those books are very heavily influenced by my hero, which is uh, Sue Townsend, who wrote uh, Adrian Mole, which is still the greatest book I ever read because I read it when I was the same age as Adrian Mole, 13. Um, but I released three or four of those books during COVID and I couldn't do anything with them. I couldn't visit schools. I couldn't do book events and so on. So that's my long winded way of saying yes, but it's getting harder. Um, it is getting harder for all of us. I'm sure for you guys as well, uh, any writers listening, um, fewer print, uh, publications. Now most people read online. Um, and you know online it's hard to make money so i do but i supplement it with um a lot of talks and uh, workshops and uh, I, I i go to a lot of schools and universities and colleges and, and that kind of thing as all writers do and it's it's not something you can play at if you're if you're if you're serious about you know being a writer you've got to do it every day um you know weekends whatever um just to keep your head above water yeah um i love what i do you know i've wanted to be a writer since i was 11 so um i do love what i do but it's hard and um challenging and uh, you're constantly fighting for eyeballs and attention because we are literally saturated with more entertainment opportunities than ever before streaming platforms tv laptop phones whatever so it is challenging, but um, I love it. And I'm very fortunate that I've been able to do it now for about 15 years. I think, Laura, about 15 years on and off and still surviving. Just. <laughs> We're quite a mixed community in our group. It's sort of writers, readers, publishers, right. all sorts. Well, readers, God bless every single <laughs> one of you. I mean, really, I, 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 I can't. I can't stress that enough, really. I, I, I've always said that because um, I'm, I've written 26 books now and I still get amazed when people buy my books. Um, I, st you know, I still treat every book like it's the first book I've ever sold and uh, I'm still flabbergasted when people turn up at book events and bookstores. And um, for that reason, you know, I, when I wrote my first book, in 2001 it was like a social commentary humor uh, bill bryson-esque type of book about southeast asia there was no facebook <laughs> there wasn't even youtube there was no twitter i mean even the internet was quite new so back in those the good old days listen to me anybody could go into any bookstore and not even have um you know a pre-publicized event you could literally just turn up with a table and say, I'd like to talk to you about my new book. And I guarantee you'd have a hundred people because there was not that, there was not so many distractions then. Now it's much more challenging. So, um, oh, geez, God bless every one of you. Uh, Donna has asked which of your characters you'd take out for a meal. <laughs> um, oh, that's a great question. Which of my characters? Ah, that's a good question. Donna, right? um that's a great question donna uh, i was going to say slightly cynically bloody foreigners is quite a dark book 
and uh, and I knew I was going to. Oh, I stood the chance of being accused of um, painting uh, England in too negative a light, particularly as I don't live there. And uh, in fact, I'm almost disappointed that I did get more of a reaction. I expected more. Um, like some of the right wing media quite liked the book. And I thought they were going to come after me, but uh, they didn't really. I know one or two of my relatives don't like it very much. Um, but the point I'm making is my defense for that is always the best character, the nicest character, the kindest character, the warmest character in that book, which I think gets overlooked, is uh, Detective Chief Inspector Wicks. He is the loveliest man, the kindest man. He tolerates Low, this imposter from Singapore. He understands and empathizes with his detective mystery, Ramilla Mystery, who is herself British Indian, uh, grew up in Dagenham, like me. And um, he empathizes with her situation, being both an Indian and a woman in the Metropolitan Police Force. He is the kindest, nicest man. So whenever people say to me, or if they say to me, you know, well, you, you, not, you, know, you didn't make the English characters look very good, I say, ah, but look at DCI Wicks. He's a lovely man. Uh, he is by far the nicest character in the book. And I would happily have breakfast, lunch, and dinner with DCI Wicks. He's a kind, kind, kind man. Um, Inspector Lowe, I wouldn't want to spend, I wouldn't want to be in a lift with Inspector Lowe. <laughs> I wouldn't want to get trapped in the lift with Inspector Lowe. Although he is quite funny. He's quite sarcastic. But if I was the victim of a crime, He'd be the first person I'd call. Yeah, I was just going to say that. If you were, you wanted him to investigate something, there, he'd be the first on your list. And mystery. And that was the other point. And mystery. Uh, I, again, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm sitting on the fence, but it was very important to me in the third book that, because in the first two books, he does, Inspector Lowe, I'm aware of this, he does test not only the other character's patients, but I'm sure in places the readers as well. I'm fully aware of that. He's not often very likable. And so in the third book, I, I introduced the character of uh, Ramilla Mystery, um, the British Indian woman who's uh, an inspector with the Metropolitan Police Force. Uh, yes, I won't say any more for those who haven't read it. But um, And she is his equal. She is completely his equal. She stands up to him. She doesn't stand for his bullshit. She cuts him off. She knows when he's going on one of his intellectual, he's going down one of his intellectual rabbit holes where he's just basically showing off how smart he is. And she will just cut him off and say, no, I get it. You're smart. You don't have to perform for me. I get it. You might work with everybody else, but you don't need to do it for me. So I love that character as well. She's a, she's a great character. So I'd go for dinner with her. And uh, Wicks, and I'd make I'd make low weight in the car. <laughs> Get the tape out. <laughs> yeah, Lovely, exactly. it said that the maids in Singapore have a tough time. Laura said they're doing a second series of time. Are they really? Yeah, apparently. And she said as soon as she read the first radio presenter scene, she saw the LBC nod. If that makes sense. Ah, ah, very good. Yes, yes, yes. Where's that comment? Where's that? I want to see that. Where's that? It's, um, I'll show you it on the screen. Yes, 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 Laura. Yes, absolutely spot on, Laura. Not <laughs> for, for legal reasons, legal reasons, I have to say completely fictional. But what I will say is, um, well, you know this, because I get Sky News here in Singapore, right? So, and all media does this now. They constantly go around. It's like you and I now, Kat, uh, Kaz, you know, if we were doing a news show, You'd have to be left wing and I'd have to be right wing or vice versa. You know, we'd have to, you know, and you'd have to shout at me and I'd have to shout at you. Like when they do the, the newspaper review, I was inspired by this thing they do on Sky News every day called the, the press review or the paper review or something like that. And they have someone from the Daily Mirror and someone from the Sun or they have someone from the Guardian and someone from the Daily Mail. They do this every day on Sky. And it's got, it's become such a carrot. It's almost become such a bit of a joke that, you could almost guess what they're going to say before they open their mouth, 
right? So whatever the subject is, if it's if it's I don't know if it's Rishi Sunak, for example, and his wife, uh, you know, the Daily Mirror guy is going to savage him, and the Daily Mail guy is going to defend him, and 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 so on and so on. It's it's become so, such a such a caricature, such a silly parody that I thought I've got to have fun with this. I've got to play with this. So I got this woman who's the right wing cliche, and I've got this liberal wokey guy lives in North London, you know, gentrified North London, and he's the left wing wokey guy. And I thought I'd kind of put them together in this uh, London call-in radio show, and just go to town with it. And uh, yeah, that's 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 some of my favourite part, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's all fictional. It's all fictional. But honestly, you could literally take out their mouths what they say in the book, which I made up, and give it to any of the presenters on Sky News. You know, the left wing, the right wing, and it, it would fit. It would fit. Sam's picked up on what you were saying about the excitement and the build-up to the big police interviews in your books. And how oh, right. you, she wants to know if you know how the scene's going to play out before you sit down to write it. Great question. I, I, I know where I have to get to, yes. Like, with the, I'm not giving any spoilers, but in the case of Bloody Foreigners, um, I, I knew, obviously I knew right from the start when I sketch it out i just sketch it out on a piece of a4 i just jot down notes on a4 a couple of lines and then i put it onto the laptop and i usually have about four lines maybe that's it four lines for each for each chapter and it will change along the way but it's literally just beats so i'll know that in the interrogation that the murderer i'll say in bloody foreigners i know what his motivation is what what his psyche is and I know roughly how Inspector Lowe is going to unlock it. I know what he's going to do to unlock it. But I have no idea how long it's going to take, um, what he's going to say, until I sit, I sit in front of the laptop. And that is both the most exhilarating and most terrifying part of it, which is why I've got so much grey hair. Because um, you just don't know. You, you, you don't know what obviously of course you know i don't know word for word what they're going to say sometimes um when i my process when i write i, I don't i don't stop until it's done until the chapter is done or, or whatever i just don't even if i know in, in real time that the writing is not great I, I say to all young writers don't stop don't take the train off the track just keep going get to the station it doesn't matter if you take a few details get to the station um you, that, that's the best analogy I, I have. You know, I know I'm going from London to Manchester, but I don't know exactly how I'm going to get there, but I have to get to Manchester. So I'll do that. And then the editing process takes me often longer than the actual writing. And then I act it out. I literally act it out uh, uh, at the laptop where I'm sitting now. I, I'll say Lowe's words and I'll say his words. And it has to, I'm so particular the, especially with dialogue we all are right especially british we're all obsessed with regions and accents so lowe's accent must be correct to me um so so even if a you know british uh, an international reader reads it they might not necessarily get that he's speaking in a slightly singaporean way but i would know and a singaporean would know and likewise i might give it the killer the killer in bloody foreigners I know where he's from. Well, he's from London. And that, that's not a big secret because it's set in London. So he has to speak like a Londoner would speak that and, and that age and that age. And what I'm careful not to do, Kaz, is uh, I don't have people, I don't have teenagers from London or early 20s in London. because I don't know how they talk anymore because I don't live there. Uh, so, you know, when I hear young footballers talk or my nephews talk, the street talk and the slang. I'm a bit out of touch with the slang. So I'm comfortable with anybody over 30 where I'm pretty sure the dialogue is going to be, the London dialogue is going to be authentic. So I'll say it, I'll say it aloud, I'll go back and forth. And then if I think that the logic isn't sound, in other words, if I think that Lowe's made too much of a leap in logic too quickly, you know, he's smart, but he can't be that smart. He can't go from that to that. There needs to be more dialogue in between. Uh, so I'll add that or I'll often take dialogue out if, if I think I'm, you know, 
over egging the over egging the pudding as it were and i'll take dialogue out if i think i'm over emphasizing it so yeah but that is the fun stuff that is i love writing dialogue i, I really really enjoy writing dialogue it's by far my the, the favorite part yeah yeah are you ever tempted in the series to sort of write spin-off stories about any of the characters you know these characters that you really like well, what I what what I'm most pleased with about Bloody Foreigners is that, in theory, with that particular book, you could. I'm not sure about the other books, if I'm being very honest with you. Uh, but in the case of Bloody Foreigners, you could easily do a spin-off on mystery, uh, Detective Inspector Romana Mystery and her cases in in um, in London. Uh, being this Indian woman who grew up in Dagenham, Essex on a council estate, her father. You see, everything has to be grounded in reality for me. So I know the actual shop where she grew up because it was the, the corner shop near me, which was in Dagenham, which was run by a, a lovely Indian man who had children about my age when I was a kid. So they actually would be Mystery's age now. So when I say like it's autobiographical, I really mean it. I know who Mystery is. I know the shop she she grew up in. I know the shop her father. It, in my mind, it has to be a real shop. I have to be able to see it. So mystery could easily, you know, this Indian detective growing up in London, she's got to deal with gender. She's got to deal with uh, gender issues. She's got to deal with racial issues and what that might look like. Um, but I already know, and I can hear people probably thinking it. I'd be on. I, I don't know. I don't know is what I'm saying because. Um, we live in tricky times now and I, I just about get away with it. That I'm writing as a Chinese man. If I started writing as an Indian middle-aged Indian woman, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how much, how much latitude I would get. Um, you've, you've now got a school of thought that says boys can't write about girls and girls can't write about boys. Obviously I'm not going to agree with that, but I, I'm aware of the sensitivities yet. Yeah. Ha, ha, yeah i am but mystery definitely could uh wicks possibly yes uh more so if it was uh prequels uh oh there's so many the the, the djs the radio hosts i think laura mentioned you definitely could um the other character i like the, the far right leader you could but he's such a he's such an a-hole though but yeah he's um he's a good character he's a good character so yeah in bloody foreigners you could, you know, my ambition, my lofty ambition with with my books is I'm very influenced by also uh, David Simon, who who wrote The Wire, if you know The Wire, very famous TV show, amazing TV show. Amongst many other things he's wrote that's great as well in, in New York and, and Baltimore. He just did one a couple of years ago called uh, The Juice, which was set in 1970s Manhattan, the, the porn industry. Extraordinary. But the layers that they build in of, of politicians and people on the street and corrupt this and police and the layers of different levels and facets of society is what I try to do in Bloody Foreigners. So you've got the detective here and then you've got the politician here and you've got the radio hosts here and how they possibly all overlap uh, at various parts of the book. So, yeah, there's, there's probably about three or four. If anyone wants to do it, be my guest. <laughs> Is there going to be more any 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 more Inspector Lowe books? Hope so. I, I hope so. I, I, I am toying with something at the moment. And uh, I am my world's worst critic. So it needs a bit more work. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I do. I like him. But I also like mystery as well. I'm a big fan of her. So... You heard it here first. You know, I took <laughs> Inspector Lowe to London. Maybe I'll take Inspector Mystery to Singapore. Maybe. And, and then do the opposite. The fish, the fish out of water the other way around. Uh, there could be some fun with that. Yeah. That sounds good. Uh, you've been asked about the workshops you run. Are they for adults and children? Yeah. And I get I, lots of different ones because, um, believe it or not, I... Um, I actually sort of got well known in Singapore for writing, uh, like I say, these social commentary humorous books that then morphed into a humor column 
that I used to write for the national newspapers here. And so from that, I, I do a lot of workshops with children, uh, uh, secondary school, about how to write humorously, how to write funny. Um, I do that, how to push the boundaries, particularly in a conservative country, Singapore can be. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so how to write satire, how to uh, push the, what they call in Singapore, the OB markers, the out of bounds markers, you know, how to push at the sort of corners of a, of quite a conservative society. So I do that. And I also do um, some work on fiction. Recently, I did a, I had a great thing. I went to the American school, the international American school in Singapore, and I worked with their top young writers. They're all about 18 years old just before they graduate, uh, leave school and go to university. And the best writers were putting together an anthology of short stories, uh, like 40 short stories. So I would come in and go through like really intense one-on-one -on -one workshopping with them. It's, it's, it's so rewarding, but intellectually exhausting because there's 40 different stories and they're all completely different. And so I would go in with them and, and really sort of quickly, um, intellectually workshop each and every short story and kick it around and get it into shape and uh, give them some suggestions so that then they could go away and, and rewrite it. I, um, I enjoy that a lot. I enjoy that a lot. Yeah. Right. We've got four minutes left. You could take as long as you want because I came in late and I, I'm going to feel bad about this forever. Um, <laughs> Don't worry I, about it. Give a, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Um, before we even get to the end bit, it's absolutely been ace. And then um, Sam's commented and said the same and put a link to your website on um, for everyone watching. But give us a reminder about your books and things. The yes, they are. Um, the Inspector Low trilogy is uh, Marina Bay Sins, which is Inspector Low. So there them. you go. And I haven't. I haven't got them. <laughs> Look at that. You have, you have them before me. Um, <laughs> Uh, Marina Bay Sins is the first one, and that is set in the, you know, which is now quite famous hotel, uh, famous hotel Marina Bay Sands. There's a murder, a double murder at Marina Bay Sands, and Lowe has to come in, and it's this whole international intrigue involving expats and businessmen. The second one is Rich Kill, Poor Kill, which I mentioned, which is about an expatriate British, I always make them British, uh, British uh, serial killer on the loose in Singapore. And then the third one is I took Inspector Lowe to London because I always had that in my back pocket. I always had the fact that I sent him to university in the backstory to the London School of Economics because I knew that ultimately Inspector Lowe is me. And so I had to kind of anglicize him a bit. And lots of Singaporeans do go to university in the UK. That's how I ended up in Singapore is because I met someone at Manchester University and he invited me to Singapore. So I always had that in my back pocket that he could have an excuse to go back to England at some point. And it's such a great setup. I don't think I'll ever beat the premise of bloody foreigners because it's so simple, which is after the previous cases. And if you don't, if you haven't read them, it doesn't matter. But basically the Singapore police force are so fed up with him. <laughs> But they can't fire him because he's good at his job. But he's so obnoxious. They think, I know what we'll do. We'll send him on some university tour to talk about criminology. That'll get rid of him. And uh, so he goes to London. And as luck would have it, there just happens to be a murder, as there always is, of a Singaporean in Chinatown. What are the chances? And, um, and, he's, and someone he had a... No, I'm not saying. But someone he knows from a past life asks for his advice. And I must tell you about that book. Um, I was so paranoid, Kaz, about that book because I, I didn't want anyone to say, oh, he's not there. He's not there. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't live in England anymore, which is fair. So um, when, I was when I was writing it or editing it, I can't remember which, I went back to England with my family. And this would have been 20, December 2018. It was the last time I've been to England. I haven't seen my parents since this 2018. And I spent a day. This is what we do. I spent a day in Chinatown being the murderer. Because I had to make sure that it was plausible. 
So I found the exact spot where the murder could take place conceivably. It's a real street, Dancy Place is a real road in London. Um, so I actually, <laughs> I actually acted out the murder. Uh, like there was, it was in the back street of Chinatown and I looked around and there was no CCTV footage, uh, the cameras, because I didn't want some smart aleck to say, there's three, there's 15 CC cameras in that street. That could never happen. So there was no CCTV there. So I actually timed how long the murder would roughly take. And then I would, and I walked out into the street and I said, right, there's a camera there. So he can't go that way. So he could conceivably go that way. He could park his moped that over there and then off he went. So I spent a very, very enjoyable day, Cass, in uh, in uh, Chinatown being a murderer. It was great. <laughs> so nobody can come back at me and say it couldn't happen because I did it. Yeah. Right. Before we finish, I'm going to read you some of the last comments that we've got. So Laura said, thank you. Great interview. Highly recommendable to do foreigners. Must go back and read the first two. The first two, well, the first one got a five-star review from me, which is very rare. And the second one is probably going to do the same. Um, Leslie, I think, has, has said it's been a fab hour. She thinks you'd need a few hours and she's going to check out your books. Thank you. Um, Laura has given you a bit of a help and said you could send low anywhere, thanks to Interpol. And Sam has said that she'll be your assistant if you come to Manchester and need to act out a murder. Uh, you know what, Sam? I, I, for, nost for Purely for nostalgic reasons, because I studied there for three years. I had a very happy time. I had a happy time, but um, I was very poor. You know, all students are, right? But I was, like, really, really poor. So I, I feel I owe it to Manchester to go back, you know, and... Uh, I did go back. I, I told Sam this. I did go back in 2002 as a sports journalist. I covered some football matches. I went to Old Trafford and uh, Anfield, Liverpool. So I covered some matches. But I still want to go back. I want to take my daughter there because Manchester is such a great city to kill someone. <laughs> because it's got, it's such a, it's like, for, you know, Peaky Blinders would be a good example because you've got that Victorianness about it. You know, it's Singapore. It was the world's first industrial city, as we all know. So, you know, you've got the canals and, you you know, you've got the canals and the back streets and the Victorian architecture. And it's a lot of it's quite gothic. A lot of the like my university building is quite gothic. So it has so much potential to do a load. And of course, the Chinatown in in, um, in Manchester is legendary. I mean, it's huge. It's massive. So, um there's so much potential there. There's so much potential there. But as one of the readers has pointed out, uh, I sometimes think that Laura is completely right. I made a mistake. I should have just made him work for Interpol from the start. I had to, you know, why did I focus on being so damn realistic? You know, so Jimmy McGovern. If I if I'd have just made him work for Interpol, he could have bloody got anywhere, whatever I liked, you know. So I'm still trying to work that one out. Maybe but they can Laura's, still hand him right. to Interpol because he's so good and they want rid of him. Maybe they can second him to Interpol for another or two. You could be right. You could be. It's a good idea, actually. That's actually a good idea. Um, but I, I know nothing about Interpol, um, so I'd have to do some research on it. But, yeah, I do like Inspector Lowe, um, warts and all. I mean, I just think there's something about there's something about flawed. There's just because we are flawed, right? We're all flawed. I'm flawed. So there's just something about flawed characters that I find personally very appealing. Um, you know, just to detour briefly, th th those sort of like CSI 60 minute procedurals that my, that they're okay. They're fine. But this is just my personal opinion. I, I find them a bit generic, you know, and I I've never personally been just personal preference. I've never been that interested in the how, of the murder, you know, as a, as a reader and a writer, that's just me. I know you have to have it. I know there has to be an element of procedural in all crime fiction. And, and don't get me wrong. Some people love it. You know, like the Lee child readers, particularly men, you know, they love to know the caliber of the bullet and the size of the gun and the distance. If you read Jack Reacher, it's nearly all like that. That's fine. You know, that's absolutely fine. But I've always been more interested in the why uh why the murders are committed rather than the how if anything i'm a bit guilty of just almost skipping over the how and just getting to the why because 
fraud, fraud killers, fraud detectives. That's why I like Inspector Lowe, because he's flawed, he's human, he's fragile, he's frail. Uh, some of the best parts I write, or, or the or best parts I like, is when you'll see him, you know, go into a police station and take charge and bully everybody and show off his intellectual genius. And then in the next chapter, you'll see him curled up in a ball in his bed. You know, he, he doesn't even, he can't even get out of bed. I can personally relate to that, <laughs> and uh, I suspect some readers do as well. So I do really appreciate the feedback because um, I have a soft spot for him. I do. He's a miserable old so and so, but I do have a soft spot for him. Yeah, he's great, and you've been great as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Absolute pleasure, and uh, I'm happy to do this anytime, and I'll be on time next time. <laughs>